Hey guys, Daily Tech here, bringing you five easy ways to improve performance using PS Move Service in your custom VR setup. Now, if this is your first time joining me and you're interested in building your own DIY VR setup, consider subscribing so you don't miss out on any VR tutorials like this in the future. Otherwise, let's get right into it. Now the first thing that gives people the most trouble doing this is USB bandwidth. This has always been a struggle to get things just right and shuffled around so you don't run into these problems, but now it's made a lot easier because you can adjust the FPS of each one of your cameras. These PSI cameras use a ton of bandwidth and they are generally the source of all of the problems. But now, that's super easy to adjust, so if you notice any kind of jittering of your controllers or when you enter a game, things just end up all over the place, bandwidth is most likely the culprit. So let's head over on screen to see how we can adjust this to eliminate any kind of bandwidth issues. Start off by opening up testcamera.exe. You'll notice at the top there are some commands to change how to test different things while testing the cameras. The one we're worried about is frame rate, which is adjusted with Y and H. To start, you'll probably want to begin with 30 FPS. You'll also want to use 640 for the frame width since this is a standard resolution for the cameras. Now that we have the cameras running, make sure you have one of the cameras in focus for the hotkeys to work. Now test out the cameras to see if the video is nice and smooth. You should see it pretty consistent without any frame loss. Now let's hit Y on the keyboard to bring the frame rate up by 10. Now it shows we're at 40 FPS and you can either visually check to make sure it's looking pretty smooth or you can also hit the space bar on your keyboard to show the frame rates for each camera. You should see it consistently stay around 40. Now let's move to 50 and try it again. Seems like everything is still good, so let's go up again to 60. At 60, it seems like everything's still good. So let's try going up one more time to 75. This is where I know I'm going to run into problems, and this is what you should be avoiding. Notice the video is choppy, and it seems to drop frames like crazy. Now I can also confirm it with the space bar, and as you can see, it's showing anywhere from 6 to about 25 frames per second. This will not work at all. So in my setup, I'm going to stick to 60. To lock in our new FPS for the cameras, let's open up the PS Move service and start up the config tool. In here, you'll want to go to tracker settings, then calibrate controller tracking colors. In here, you can see I currently have mine set to 60, but see what happens when I change the FPS. The calibration completely breaks. This is expected when you change your FPS. So just make sure you redo your color calibration for each controller on each camera once you change it. The second thing you could do is adjust your exposure and gain. Keep in mind, these two settings are on a per camera basis, so you'll only need to do this once on each camera, but when you do that, you will need to calibrate the colors of each controller again. What these two settings are going to do is going to help reduce any kind of ambient light from tracking, and it's going to make the bulbs on your controller just pop a little bit more. Let's go back to the screen and see how we can adjust these things properly and make it look as good as possible. Alright, let's head back into the tracker settings and calibrate controller tracking colors again. You'll see this looks fine in mass mode, but as soon as I change the exposure or gain, the calibration is thrown off. So stay in RGB mode and we'll want to adjust exposure down so that you have a low amount of ambient light showing. You'll see as I go up and down with this setting, it will dim and brighten any ambient lighting. So find a spot where you can bring it low enough, but not dim the bulb too much. For me, 24 looks like it's a pretty good spot. Now for the gain. You'll notice that the intensity of the bulb changes as I adjust this up and down. Moving this up will make it brighter and if you go too high it'll wash out the color and make it look almost white. This is not what you want. So bring this up to a spot where it looks nice and bright but the color is still there. This will help to keep the cameras tracking at all times. It may also increase your range a little bit of how far your cameras will see this. For me, 64 looks like it's a pretty good spot. Any higher than that and the magenta just doesn't look right anymore. Keep in mind as well, you can go too high on this and that can actually cause a lot of problems. The light may bleed a little bit too far onto some of the surfaces that might be right nearby like your headset or a different controller. So if that starts getting too bad, back it down a little bit. 
Again, make sure you set both of these settings for each camera and then when you change it, you'll need to redo the color calibration for each one of the controllers. Ideally, you'll want to make sure that you test tracking from each camera to see if you are losing any tracking or if anything else in the room is being picked up. Here's an example of a really reflective surface I have in my room. Since I've got my exposure and gain settings set right in this room, that even with this reflection, the computer never gets confused and always keeps the region of interest box tracking the controller at all times. Now moving on to a third way to help optimize things is picking a different color for your controller. Everyone's room is going to be a little bit different. There's going to be big windows, different color LEDs flashing around your room, reflections, paint color, almost anything can affect which colors you're going to pick. Now in my room, I've got a ton of red and blue LEDs just about everywhere. So those are two horrible picks for controllers, so I stay completely away from them. Also, turns out, the LEDs inside my PC resemble the cyan color a little bit too closely. So that's one I have to stay away from as well. Since, since I use three controllers, I have to use the last three colors that are available. Those are going to be yellow, green, and magenta. Now there's one small trade-off that affected me pretty big time that I want to let you know about. When using the green color, if I had any kind of light coming out of my window, that's going to wash out the green like crazy. It didn't seem to affect the other colors all that much, but green was a total disaster. But out of the options I had, it was the only one that I can control the best. So just keep that in mind if you decide to go with green. And a note to this, try to make sure you always have the exact same room lighting in your room. This is going to make sure that your colors are always tracked properly and your calibration will never be thrown off. Now these last two tips are going to be for optimizing the controller orientation. So number four is over calibrating your magnetometer. Now previously I've already made a video on how to do this so this time I'm just going to give you the high level of it. If you want to see this step in a little bit more detail check the card in the top right of your screen. But for now let's get back to the desktop and see exactly what I'm talking about. In the config tool, restart the magnetometer calibration on the controller that's giving you issues. I like to zoom out a little bit and then turn the box on an angle so I can see all sides of it. Now just start moving it around as you normally would. Once it passes 100%, keep going until you no longer see the box growing in size. You'll also want to make sure you see plenty of white dots inside that sphere. You'll also want to make sure that you change hands as well. This will help you hit different angles than you normally would with just the one hand. Once it's complete, put the controller down and finish off the calibration as normal. Using this method will make sure that you get your full range of motion and get the best accuracy possible. And now the fifth and final way to optimize this is making sure your batteries are fully charged on the controllers. I know it sounds super simple, but just having your controllers die down a little bit too much can give you really odd behavior. So before you go banging your head against the wall wondering why your controllers are acting a little bit squirrely, make sure you leave them on the charger overnight just to make sure they're not just dying down a little too far. The best thing to do is just make sure you leave controllers charging when they're not in use because the type of batteries they are is really no big deal just to leave them on the charger all the time. But keep in mind if this starts happening really soon after you take the controller off the charger you may need to replace your batteries. Luckily. Those aren't too expensive and they're not too hard to change on your own. I got links in the description below to show you exactly what batteries to get and I got a video series that includes a teardown of the remote exposing the battery so you can easily change it. But if you are using two or more controllers, keep in mind when charging you are going to need a PlayStation or you're going to have to have it plugged into your computer while your computer is turned on. You'll need a mini USB cable for each one and if you're using Navi controllers that's probably a total of five different cables sticking out of your computer. Now what I've done personally, I got myself a full charger for everything. I can charge all five controllers at the same time and my PC doesn't even need to be turned on. For a full review and unboxing of that charger that I'm using, check the card in your top right of your screen again because I haven't regretted a single day since I got this. Well, that's about it. Hopefully one or two of these tips help to give you better performance using the PS Move service. There are a ton of other little minor things you could do to help tweak things, but if you follow these five, you really should get yourself some pretty nice results. So thanks a lot for watching this video, and don't forget to leave it a like if you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.